Hi, my name's Jean. I'm 32 years old. I live in London and I have a condition called Ellis Danlos Syndrome Type 3. Okay. Ellis Danlos is a connective tissue disorder. It's very hard to describe what the whole condition is, so I'm going to tell you what the ellisdanlos.org website, which is the UK charity for EDS sufferers, says and add in my own experience as I'm going through. Ellis Danlos syndrome is a genetic connective tissue condition characterised by skin extensibility, joint hypermobility and tissue fragility. There are six different types of EDS and they are classified according to signs and symptoms. EDS is caused by a defective protein called collagen. There are more than 30 different types of collagen in the body and it is the main building block providing strength and support. Examples of areas that are affected are ligaments, tendons, organs and the skin. Consequently, when collagen itself is defective, this can produce many problems throughout the body. The prevalence of EDS is known to affect both males and females of all races and ethnic backgrounds. The exact incidence is not known, but it's estimated that 1 in 5,000 people are sufferers and continued research advancements are showing that this could be even more prevalent than that. A short example of what EDS can do is it's painful, excruciatingly painful. I spend my life living on morphine plus other analgesics, opioid based mainly, just to control the pain. They are what are allowing me to sit here now to be able to talk to you. Um, I can dislocate my shoulders just rolling over in bed when I'm sleeping at night. I can walk into things because they are not where my eyes tell me they are and so I have problems with space proximity. I can drop things very easily so I'm not allowed in the kitchen on my own to make a drink or make food because of the injuries that I've sustained. If um, my hand loses grip, dropping the kettle or dropping a pan when I'm trying to empty out the boiling water for example, uh, dropping a knife when I've been trying to prepare vegetables. Um, friends eventually stop calling and asking you to go out because they're sick and tired of you saying that you're too tired or you're not well or that you will meet them and go out and then when the appointment comes round having to ring and cancel. You can't make plans with EDS because you never know one day how you're going to feel, how you're going to be, whether you're going to be in one piece or not when you wake up the next. The diagnosis is based on presenting symptoms and family history of a patient. Many EDS sufferers, however, do not, convey, do not fit conveniently into the def definition of a specific type and are frequently misdiagnosed. Most people with EDS have a general diagnosis of one specific type, but EDS is a crossover diagnosis. So I, for example, have my main diagnosis as EDS3 which is mainly problems with joints and ligaments but I also have some vascular crossover which is problems with my veins, my internal organs, specifically with me, my female organs um, and my bladder and my bowels. Um, a skin biopsy may be taken to confirm the diagnosis and determine the type. Of the six types, the hypermobility type is the only one that does not have a specific biopsy test to be done for it. So you can only be diagnosed if you have a GP who is aware of EDS who can send you to one of the three specialists in the country to get a formal diagnosis, which makes it even harder to be diagnosed and if your GP doesn't know about EDS, then they will spend years either bobbing you off as being an attention seeker or hypochondriac because you go in and tell them that you're sick and they can't find anything wrong with you. Even worse, if it's a child and you're the parent, 
parents often get accused of having Munchausen's by proxy because they're going in and saying that the children are sick or the children are saying that they are sick and the doctors can't find anything wrong with them. So they presume that it's the parent making the child sick or making the child believe that they are sick. This is a life destroying condition. Not only do you have the pain to deal with, not only do you have the dislocations to deal with, the unexplained bruising, the gastric issues, if you're female, the menstrual issues, the isolation because people don't understand and get sick of you complaining about being ill all the time or get sick of you letting them down all the time. If you have vascular EDS, your life expectancy is only 40 years anyway, because at some point you will sustain an injury, which could be as simple as someone elbowing you in a crowd. That could burst your appendix, it could burst your liver or your stomach and kill you. As I said, the condition is genetic, so it's something that you are born with, it's something that you always have, but it doesn't always present at birth and it doesn't always present in the same way so in my childhood I was called a clumsy child I would fall over all the time I'd take three or four steps and then fall down I was constantly getting bruises and through the night and waking up in the morning and not being able to explain how I'd injured myself or where the bruises had come through from I was absolutely useless at sports, I've got no hand-eye coordination, but I was really flexible so I was really good at things like gymnastics and horse riding and I was able to bend myself into shapes that people just couldn't understand. I can still do that now to a certain extent but because of the damage that has been inflicted on my body I'm not allowed to do it anymore. I didn't have any serious issues until puberty which is very common with people with EDS and then I started getting incredible pain levels mainly centered in my lower back and my pelvis that would last for months my parents would take me to the doctors and the doctors would say it's just growing pains um, a couple of times I was sent for physiotherapy most of the time I was just told to take some paracetamol or some female menstrual drugs and to go away and get on with it and that everything would get better but it didn't, things got gradually worse as the years went on and things have continued to get worse as the years have gone on. Because I wasn't diagnosed at the time I was trying to keep up with my peers so I was going out, I was trying to go dancing, I was actually pretty good as a dancer. I managed to get a job dancing, which again is not uncommon for people who are hypermobile. If you look at the kinds of positions that most professional dancers can put themselves in, you look at the type of positions that most professional gymnasts can put themselves in. You couldn't do that, but somebody who's hypermobile, it's second nature. Somebody with EDS can do that very easily. And it's only five, ten years later when they realise that they can't do that anymore or that it's incredibly painful and that they can't actually ignore the pain anymore that they realise that there's something wrong and start going to their doctor again and saying, hang on a minute, that pain that I had when I was a child, I've still got, only now it's ten times worse. I'm having trouble sitting up, I'm having trouble walking. I find I can't get out of bed in the morning or I'm falling over all the time. I'm making this video to support a friend um, because I have been through a very similar situation to her. As I said earlier, EDS can be life destroying and not just in the sense that you can die. Um, this is my daughter. Her name is Morgan. She is currently nine years old. This is the only photo that I'm legally allowed to show you and this was taken on the 14th of April 2003.
the day she was born. She's currently nine hours old in this photograph. She was taken from me and she was adopted because of the EDS. Because I was not well enough to be able to look after her on my own and I had not been diagnosed as having EDS at the time. Social services decided that I was an unfit mother, that I wasn't safe and that because I wasn't disabled, I wasn't entitled to the support that they would have to provide a parent with disabilities and so they took her from me. I was told that I would never be able to have children so when I found out at 22 that I was pregnant I was so shocked that I fainted. The first thing I did at my first antenatal appointment was ask for a social worker for help because I knew that I was ill. I had been diagnosed as having mental health issues because the doctors I had at the time couldn't find out what was physically wrong with me but I was always complaining I was in pain, I was always tired. Because nobody believed that there was anything wrong with me I used to self-harm because having a physical wound people could understand, they could accept that I was in pain because they could see what it was that was causing the pain even though I knew that that wasn't why I was in pain. Um, I was diagnosed as having dependent personality disorder and later on social services attempted to attach a diagnosis of Munchausen syndrome by proxy onto that. I was able to successfully fight that diagnosis and I have since had all of my mental health diagnoses discharged because I've been successfully diagnosed as having Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. But back to my beautiful baby girl. She was born and I spent a week in hospital and I was taught how to bathe her, how to feed her, how to sterilise her equipment. I was able to cope with 24 hour support around me so that all my attentions were focused on my baby and I was just eating because food was put in front of me, drinking because there was a drink in front of me, having a shower because one of the nurses came up to me and said, Jean, you know, we'll watch baby for five minutes, you go and have a shower, etc. Then I was discharged and I was discharged into my mother and stepfather's care. And again, while I was around support, while I was having that attention, I was able to cope. And then my daughter became ill and had to go into hospital again. And social services decided that it was my fault that she was ill. Even when the doctors told them that it was just a bacteria that babies pick up, it's common, they wouldn't listen. They decided that it was something that I wasn't doing right. I either wasn't washing my hands enough when I was changing her nappy or I wasn't sterilising her bottles properly. And then there was an allegation that I'd hit her and she was taken away. She was examined and there was no evidence of anything that could be found. But social services said that they were taking her for respite for two weeks and then I'd get her back. And they never gave her back. They decided that I was too mentally fragile to be able to look after her. And I wasn't going to take that. I knew that I was physically ill. And so I decided I was going to fight. And I fought all the way through the court. I kept them in court until she was two and a half years old. She was 12 weeks old when she was taken. I kept fighting until she was two and a half. Um, I kept saying that I was physically disabled, that there was a physical reason that I was sick and nobody was listening. Nobody would believe me. Social services refused to give me any physical assessment to put any physical care package in place to actually help me look after my child. They kept saying that it was all down to my mental health, that it was completely down to my mental health. I have got court documents here 
going all the way back to 2003. This file is so heavy that I cannot actually lift it, documenting psychiatric reports that were saying with the correct help and support I would be able to look after my child. With the correct care package I would be able to manage. Social services just ignored that. As far as they were concerned it was cheaper to adopt her than it was to put a care package in place and anyway I didn't have a physical diagnosis and they only put care packages in place for physically disabled parents. And so after two residential assessments and numerous psychiatric assessments, two and a half years in the court, she was adopted. I haven't seen her since 2005 and I don't expect to see her for at least another eight years, if ever. I continued to bounce up and down within my mental health or what was diagnosed as being my mental health having periods of good health where I was able to go out and work and periods of serious ill health where I could barely get out of bed and then in 2007 I was working as a barmaid in a local bar and I came home from work one night and fell over in my garden while I was playing with my dog. I just couldn't get up. My partner at the time had to ring an ambulance to come and get me because we just could not get me up off the ground. It was as if my legs had turned to jelly. He could lift me but as soon as he tried letting go that was it. I fell straight back down again. I had no strength left. I was taken to hospital where the doctors said that they couldn't find anything wrong with me. They x-rayed me, they took MRI scans, they couldn't find anything physically wrong, but they observed themselves that I was not able to stand up unaided. I was given steroid shots into my legs that went directly into my hip sockets that were supposed to work within a few weeks. Six months later, at my checkup, I was still unable to stand up for any length of time, even with support. And so the ortho orthopaedic doctor admitted that he didn't know what was wrong with me and asked me if it would be okay to send me to the National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore for a second opinion, which I agreed to. I went there and they diagnosed me as having EDS but said that they wanted to send me to a specialist to get the diagnosis confirmed. I had the diagnosis confirmed in April 2008. I was 27 and I am average for receiving a diagnosis. If you receive a diagnosis before your 20s you're incredibly lucky or your parents have already got a diagnosis or your siblings have already got a diagnosis. I know of people who haven't been diagnosed until they're in their 40s or 50s. Um, I was wheelchair bound. I had been since I'd fallen over that night and to a major extent I still am now five years later. My body was so tired of having to try and live a normal life that my muscles just couldn't take anymore and they had given up and shut down. So although they look normal and my joints look normal-ish, they just don't have any strength in them to be able to do normal things. I can't hand laundry. I can load the washing machine but once I've emptied it I can't carry the basket with the wet laundry out into the garden to be able to peg the shop, the laundry up. I, up until a few months ago, couldn't go shopping on my own because I wasn't physically capable of standing up long enough to get things down off the shelves or to put things in and out of the shopping trolley if they were heavy. I 
have to sleep in a very funny position. I sleep almost sitting up because I can't lie down flat anymore. My back just can't take the pressure. It hurts my ribs, my lungs and my sternum to be lying flat. I can't walk very far so I have to rely on either a walking frame, a wheelchair or a mobility scooter to be able to get me around. I'm exhausted 90% of the time. I spend 60% of my life in bed either sleeping or just in so much pain or so fatigued that I haven't got the strength to get out of it. And that's without even talking about the pain and the dislocations. I'm lucky now I have a diagnosis. I have the correct care package. I have the correct medication and the correct support. People who don't have that, life is horrendous. And lots of people, even with the correct support, get to the point where the pain is just so severe that they've been through all the medication that is available that they commit suicide just because there is nothing else that they can use. I'm, I'm tenacious. I belong to support groups. I know other people with EDS who I can go to if I'm feeling glow, who know exactly what I'm going through and can give me the strength to get through the next few hours, the next few days. But it's hard. Um, because I received my diagnosis, I was able to start an appeal against social services, against the way that I was treated when my daughter was being adopted, against the fact that they refused to address my disabilities and accept that I had any physical things wrong with me. I had, again, it took two and a half years, I'd started my appeal in April 2008 and this is my judgement which is dated the 19th of August 2010. I won my appeal on several grounds relating to my physical disability. Ground one is that it is clear that social services failed to undertake an assessment of Jean's known disability, so we partially uphold this aspect of the complaint. Ground two Although we cannot say that her fatigue was or was not caused by the physical condition, we are satisfied that the local authority did make the assumption that her fatigue was down to mental health and not physical health needs, and so uphold the second aspect of her complaint. The third ground is that if correct, the correct level of support had been provided by the Social Services Department, then a more favourable assessment may have been achieved. And the panel said that this was purely speculation and therefore we are unable to reach a finding in this relation. And so, once having my diagnosis, I was able to prove that I had been treated unfairly by social services, that they had refused to acknowledge my disability. This brings me to the point of making this video and that's to support my friend Tracy and this little lad here, her amazing 11 year old son Daniel. He also has EDS. His EDS though is a hundred times worse than mine. You can notice the tube going through his nose, down his throat. He can't eat. He hasn't been able to eat for years because the EDS in him affects his esophagus his stomach and his bowels. He just simply cannot process food. So this tube here is what feeds him. He also dislocates multiple times every day. He's often so ill that he can't get out of bed for weeks at a time. And so the school have to send teachers out to teach him at home. He is in so much pain every day that he often wakes up in tears, goes to bed in tears 
and spends most of the day crying. But look at that amazing smile. He is an inspiration. He never lets this disease beat him. He always finds something throughout the day to be positive about, something to be happy about. Whether it's friends visiting or whether it's the chance to be able to get out of bed for half an hour and watch something on TV or to be able to go for a walk. Social services are trying to take this little boy away from his family. They are trying to say that there is nothing wrong with him, even though he has medical evidence and diagnosis letters from five separate specialists, all confirming that he has Ellis Danlos syndrome. Social services won't read the medical evidence. All they see is a little boy who looks completely normal, whose parents keep taking him to hospital, whose parents keep him in bed, who believes that he is ill when, and he is not getting any better. He is dying while we are waiting for a cure for this condition. And social services have decided that his parents either have Munchausen's by proxy or that he's making this all up. And he, they are wanting to take him away from his family and to put him into a secure psychiatric unit to find out which is the case. They are hoping that if he's away from his parents, he will miraculously get better. This just isn't going to happen. Nothing is going to save this little boy apart from a miracle. Nothing is going to save me apart from a miracle. What we need is help, understanding, support and the correct medical attention. And that just is not being provided to this child. I'm doing this video to be sent to social services to try and make them understand that Daniel is not making this up, that his parents aren't deliberately making him sick, that EDS is real. Tracy is asking anyone who suffers from Ellis Danlos Syndrome to please make a testimonial, whether you video it, whether you write it down, and to send it to her. You can contact her on tracynorton99 at gmail.com. We need to do everything we can as a community to keep this family together. Eight years ago, social services took away my daughter. Now they are trying to take Daniel from his family. Tomorrow, it may be your children that they come for. We cannot let this happen. We have to stop this.